I'm really excited that I'm joined by two fabulous Wizard of Ads partners, my friend Ryan Shute and Todd Lyles. Ryan does a lot of work with contractors, um, spe really specializes in that. And Todd has service excellence, also works with a lot of contractors. And I'm in a unique situation right now, right here, we're in De December 23, and I'm dealing with three of my own home service issues. And of course, you know, having 25 years of experience as a customer service person, I don't know whether I'm being like really disloyal and fickle and nitpicky, or maybe we can look at it from the point of view is that really I am a customer and am I being outrageous in, in the way I view things? And I wanted to get us together because there, there, there are two quotes that really stick out to me from our mentor, Roy Williams. Number one, it's really hard to read the label when you're inside the bottle. And so I figure for a lot of business owners, they don't get to hear the interaction from the customer point of view very often, except when they're really complaining. But this hopefully applies to a lot of people and they can get these things done. And then the second one is the price of clarity is the risk of insult. Okay. So you can tell me I'm being a terrible customer. It's, it's okay. That's fine. We can get it out. So we'll, we'll, role play this where one of you is that will actually be the, the business owner and the other one will be the outside consultant and then we'll swap for the next scenario. So I want to start with the first one. I think it's a little simpler thing. We all know in the HVAC business, right? The, the goal is to get those installs, right? That's the big ticket item. So about two years ago, I had one of my two units uh, replaced. I had all new duct work put into my attic and with that job, they offered me two years of ongoing service. Uh, six months into it, I get a notification to schedule uh, my, my, my first tune-up. That was a whole fiasco to begin with, but that's a whole different story we're not even going to get into. But we got that done, went well, and since then, I have never heard from them. <laughs> not once. Known brand here in town. And... I also had smart thermostats installed, which just notified me that it's time for my tune-up. Guess what? That's been about three weeks ago. Still haven't heard from them. Am I a sucky customer to say, these guys really don't care about my relationship. They got my big bucks. And maybe now I should start looking for somebody else who values me. Go for it. Right. Who do you want to be the business owner in this case? I almost want Ryan to be the business owner because I know that this is something close to his heart and in, in getting into the HVAC world. So what do you think, Ryan? Yeah, I, as a business owner, a lot of the time we're tugged and pulled towards the dispatching for dollars. That AC repair on a three-year-old, two-year-old system means basically a lost lead call. It's a zero ticket potential. Uh, most likely it's going to most likely just turn into wasted time that I don't have time to send out my guys to because I want to send them on demand calls. Is that the thing that's actually serving my customer well for me to get back? A and what I've recently realized in talking with people like Todd, it Todd, when I say people like Todd, I'm Todd, uh, <laughs> is that we've made this mistake of thinking that an existing customer is a real thing because Service Titan says existing customer within their actual framework. When what we actually have is a person who was a former customer and that very likely they could be a future customer if we didn't sully the deal. And as a business owner, I've had to come to the realization that if I am to expect relational customers to stay with me, that I have to act in relational ways. Now, you're in the middle of shoulder season in Austin, Texas. You sure as heck should have somebody out there within three days at the very latest let alone three weeks. So yeah, I think that as business owners, we have a responsibility to, to not just our customer, but also to our culture. 
one of the things I think that we're missing here is that when we tell our technicians to go out and sell those club memberships, that they feel that they're either standing for something right and virtuous or they're standing for something that is just an absolute concocted web of lies. And it's a web of lies because we're saying your priority and then the very first thing we do is treat them like the worst people on earth. Like we treat them worse than our worst marketed lead. This is like an ex uh, girlfriend that you, you know, that cheated on you. Like you're never going to call this person back. You're never going to treat them right. You're not going to go out when you say you're going to go out. How long does a relationship last before you've actually just give up and move on <laughs> to the next guy? Do you text the guy back and say, hey, you guys didn't even bother responding to me in three weeks. I guess I'm going to go date someone else. No, you just go. You just you move know? on. Yeah. And, and so I'd, I don't think that you're being unreasonable, but I do think that as a business, we very often are trapped into doing what we feel is living up to our fiduciary duty of cash flow and making sure that we are dispatching for dollars along the way. And I think we just have to, to recognize that there is a balancing act to be made there. But if we care most about relational customers, we have to act relationally, not transactionally. Yeah. I think you're saying it really well, Ryan. And as a consultant, having an opportunity to work with hundreds of companies and also seeing some of the data on the backside of it, one of the things that is interestingly true is that if you have a thousand club members and you are putting energy into getting a thousand of those people to get their service performed, you will not get a thousand of those people to do it. Um, it's, it's been a while since I've, I've dove into the exact numbers, but it's somewhere around about the 50% mark. So if a company's putting a hundred percent of the energy into it, you're still going to get maybe 50% of the people reply to you. And that doesn't mean you're going to lose those other 50 that didn't do their tune up that year. They may go two or three years. So there is a practicality side of this that I think a lot of businesses are actually not even considering, which is I think what a homeowner wants is they want the promise to be kept. And that promise can be kept even without delivering the solution if the homeowner chooses to wait a season. So I think the thing that we should do is contact 100% of everyone that we gave a promise to without fail. And I would even suggest that the best ways to do that is automation. Let's use email. Let's use text message. Let's use ringless delivery. Let's not actually engage manpower into that act because that's probably not going to be very productive anyway. Let them call in to book their call or even make it easier on them. Let them have a portal to where they can schedule their own call. So I think if you took two to three attempts with a hundred percent of your clients, you're still not going to get a hundred percent of them to respond, but not one of them is going to be upset with you. They're upset for the lack of communication. And so I saw something yesterday I thought was pretty interesting. It, it came from the four items that make someone referable that are habits. And this is based off a study. And, and when I read this to my team yesterday, I said, I want this to be true for us and for our people. Number one is to show up on time. It's mm -hmm. the number one lie contractors tell people. So number two is to do what you say. And number three is finish what you start. And the fourth one is just say please and thank you. And I think that's what we're talking about here is contractors not finishing what they start and not doing what they say and not showing up on time and not saying please and thank you. They're breaking all four of the keys to referability. So this morning, Madison, who is our CSR coach, wrote me and said, essentially, this is what I love about this team. This is what I appreciate about you because I sent her a, a blog that will be posted soon and it refers to the four dispatching methods and we all know three of the dispatching methods first come first serve regional dispatching and dispatching for profits i said madison what i want to make sure that you are covering in every conversation that you have is the fourth method and the fourth method is dispatching for integrity 
And dispatching for integrity is when the first thing that we put above all else is the promise that we made. So you can actually end up having a combination of all three of those things interacting with each other, but we never not keep the promises that we make. And again, it goes back to, that's probably one of the first promises that's broke is when someone takes time off to get their club membership service done and the company cancels them because there's a high generating call that's coming in. That's a great way to upset people. So as a consultant, I'm empathetic to it. And I'll frankly tell you that in the past, there have been times when I've said, hey, if you've got a tune-up on the board, that's two years, and now you have a 14-year system to replace, I would call them, let them know that an emergency has come up. And this is what we've taught in the past. Step number one is that you call them up, say you're, tell them you're sorry. This is why we're doing it. And what we're going to do is we're going to completely waive your tune-up fee. There'll be no fee for service if you will allow us to reschedule you. Because those things do happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if it has to happen a second time, God forbid it does. If it happens a second time, then I recommend that you even waive a repair to a certain dollar amount or give them a free maintenance. But ideally, you don't let it happen a second time. Now, that's what like a schedule tune up with club memberships. Boy, that that sort of puts your club membership at risk of integrity. I don't know what your promise was. If your promise was in writing that we would never in a million years schedule someone over you, you better keep that promise. And if you don't intend on doing that, just don't make that promise. And and I think that's okay. If you don't make that promise, then you didn't break it. If your culture company says, we'll schedule you at a time that's convenient for both of us. And I know companies that write it that way. Most people are okay with that, but convenience is important. So let's talk about a caveat to that. So if that's your company and the reality is that there is probability that this tune-up could come at conflict, there's an easy solution to that. And that easy solution is to say, Brian, we know you're busy and we're going to do everything to be on time. This is our commitment to you. Our technician will alert you or our team member will alert you 30 minutes prior to his arrival. We'll let you know when he's on his way. That way it'll give you time to leave work. If that works for you, if you need an hour, let us know. We'll we'll alert you in time so that you're not sitting there waiting on us. You can meet us inside of a tight window. So there are solutions, but the end of the day, what it boils down to is you got to keep your promise and whatever promise you made, you need to keep that promise. Yeah. They promised me that I'd have two years where they take care of the system. And I never called you. Never called, never texted. And maybe they emailed, maybe went into spam because maybe all they sent were offers, which is also a kiss of death, right? But at least if they tried with the text, because they do have my number, and said, hey, we haven't heard from you. We know that your system just alerted us. And we know it's your anniversary, right? And all that data is in service tight. It's not really that complicated. When you want us to come out, just click here. Done. So on my board over here, it says Premier Service. We believe in delivering products and services that are world-class. We invest a high level of attention to detail and deliver superior services and products on time. Let me tell you what that means in actions. This is a really key, critical core action item. And when it gets violated here, I get unglued. It is that if you communicate with someone, then that communication is not over until you hear back from them. I don't want to hear I sent an email. I want to hear, I sent an email and I got a response or I sent an email and I didn't get a response. So I sent a text message and I got a response. I sent an email, I sent a text message and I didn't get a response. So I called, I sent an email, I sent a text message. I called, I didn't get a response. So now I called the office to make sure that person's okay. To me, that's actions. And I will tolerate nothing less than that. If you engage in communication with someone, follow it all the way through to the end. So that's an action that we believe in. And now at the same token, the difference here in what we're talking about is that's an action item when something 
is important and urgent. I wouldn't treat non-urgent, non-important items with that same level of detail, nor would I treat important items that are not urgent with that same level of detail. We, we may take a couple of weeks, but if it's important and it's urgent, and there are times when that is, and at, at my opinion, at two years, it's now important and urgent. It's important and it's urgent. Someone should be reaching out to you. I don't think it's acceptable that they're casually letting your two-year promise slide by. And also knowing that they replaced one of my two units. The other unit is going to go. They will not be getting that business. That's for sure. So I think we're all in agreement on that one. But let's go to one that's a... This was a really very transactional uh, event that happened for me. My garage door wasn't working. It, it had bent and folded and all of that. I, I called in. I, I didn't have my guy. I didn't know anybody. I, I literally went on Google. I found a few that were very high rated. I sent out responses. I, I don't like getting on the phone. I'm busy. One responded real quick. I think it was less than two minutes uh, from response. I said, sure, come on by. They came at exactly the time they said. They fixed the garage door. They put up a sticker on my wall. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's probably 15 months, 16 months, something like that. And I'm noticing that the bolts are coming loose again. Hmm. Okay. I have no warm fuzzies about them. They, they were adequate. They did the job. I, I couldn't even tell you their name. <laughs> I'd have to go look, on the, look at the sticker to see if I could figure out their name. But that's about it. Um, is there something they could be doing? Because I'm ready to go back to Google again and find another garage. I, I mean, I, I actually have another person I, in mind. But otherwise, I'd be going to Google. What, 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 what do you think they should have been doing all this time? Well, it, want, want me to go as the uh, as a contractor this time? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to imagine that I'm a small, typical contractor, and you got me on the phone and you said this, and I would say the following. And I'm going to talk in the nature of a good-natured contractor. I'm probably going to go, geez, Louise, Brian, man, thank you for telling me. Look, I'll come out and I'll fix it right now. I, I didn't know that was happening. I'm surprised that it's happening. Look, I, I, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll come over as soon as I can. No, I'll call you back when I get on the schedule because he doesn't have scheduling capabilities. Mm -hmm. Now contractor comes out. He looks at what's going on. Good natured, meaning contractor. When he dives into it, what he discovers is that the reason that your bolts are coming out is because your motor is creating vibrations all the way down the track. He knows you need a new motor. He knows it's expensive. He's scared to tell you that. So good winning contractor tightens up the bolts. He comes back and says, Hey Brian, I tightened them up. Hey, look, your motor is getting a little old. You might want to keep an eye on that. Okay. And uh, here's my business card. If anything happens again, let me know. Good winning contractor leaves thinking to himself, good Lord, he needs a motor, probably needs new tracks. Those tension bars are getting worn out. That's creating extra vibration. That thing's just going to come loose again. But you know what? I didn't charge him anything today. I did the right thing. He's going to call me back. Good winning contractor goes a year, checks in with you. You've replaced your entire garage door system, and he's mad at you. You, you, you just said it, the check-in. There's been no check-in all this time. Well, no check-in. He clued in, and he finally checked in with you. And he can't understand because he took such great care of you why you would stab him in the back after he did work for you for free. This is what good meaning contractors that have no systems and procedures and workflows. This is what they do every day. Every day. By the way, this is probably what good well meaning Wizard of Ads partners do unintentionally because they're afraid to follow up. They think I did such a good job. That should be enough. You'll call me when you're ready. No. So we need a system of follow-ups. I'm going to let Ryan speak to that. He is so good at systemizing follow-ups. Yeah. you. <clears throat> I, I think that Todd nails it right on the head for an awful lot of people. I don't think that there's ill will 
at play there. There's just noise in the marketplace that didn't exist in garage doors five years ago, thanks to our friend Tommy Mello, who really has amplified that category. And all the props and respect goes to him. Now, others have come in behind him and really recognized opportunity for follow-up. We have the client who is is going to very handily beat Tommy Mello at his own game. And, and we're looking forward to those days when they completely and utterly dominate over him. And Tommy knows this guy and their friends. And we love the little bit of com- friendly rivalry here. At, at the end of the day, they created a club membership. And that club membership has the technician going out once a year to do 19 things. Now, I didn't even know there was 19 things that you could do on a garage door. I can't even imagine what those 19 things are, but these really smart people have figured that out and check on those 19 things. Do, do, you know, the one thing that they're not allowed to do, sell, right? They're there to be a maintenance company for it. Now, they are allowed to turn it over to a service if there is a service to be had for a service technician to do the service call. They're allowed to turn it over to a salesperson if if it's so required, but they don't get incentivized for doing that because the goal of the call is to build the long-term relationship, but put the eyes on the prize, understand that this thing is doing the thing that it needs to be done. And so they're going to check these 19 things. They're allowed to sell three things. Technically they're allowed to sell the rollers. They're allowed to sell the weather stripping and they're allowed to sell another year of club membership. Now, not one of those things is more than $799, but what it does protect is the relationship and the ability to check in on that door so that you don't get to the point, Brian, where you're feeling let down. It's never gotten that far. And when a garage door doesn't work, it, it's really inconvenient (laughs) because you're on your way to work or someplace cool and fun and interesting. And now you're, plans are dashed because you're not lifting that 700 pound door. You're not, you know, pushing it past the motor. And if one one of those springs breaks, holy cow, those things are like can rip through a car hood and penetrate a, an engine. Like they, like these things are, are dangerous. So maintaining your garage doors is profoundly important. Now I had no idea, but as you start to investigate these things, yes, there is a way to, to, maintain not only the relationship but the equipment and that's one of the most powerful ways that companies can do it now how much does it cost 139 bucks a year yeah i'm laughing because because when i turned my gym into my my garage pardon me i now think of it as my gym when i turned my uh, garage into a gym it was hot and it was cold in there right so I put down rubber mats. I could bounce weights on. I insulated my attic. I did that myself. I just blew an attic insulation, no big deal. And then I insulated my doors. My doors had the, the slots for it, but they didn't have the insulation. And that insulation's not very heavy, but you end up going across a 16-foot door and an 8-foot door. Anyway, so not too long after that, the springs were old, right? The, I guess it was the original garage door springs. And I was in the gym hit the button started to go up and one of the suckers blew and rammed into the wall over my head just pow and i thought that could have killed me could have absolutely got murdered by my own garage door yeah. and i called out a company they did a great job they were very professional they had a residential flat rate model the whole nine yards and he essentially educated me that what I did was I changed the weight. So he went in with springs, replaced those, and went in with torsion bars that were designed for. Now it's it's great. But, you know, the essence of what you're talking about, Ryan, and what I was talking about, it's the dichotomy of sales. And it's interesting because in your club membership, you're saying we're going to protect the client from feeling like they're being sold because they've already bought. And in the other example with this air conditioning company, they're saying, we're not going to protect the client for what they've bought because we've got nothing else to sell them. And it's really how money screws up the relationship of actually maintaining a client because they're not thinking about the right things anymore. 
they're thinking, am I going to make money on this today as opposed to, will I be there for the cycle when it occurs eight, nine years from now? Right. And uh, it's short term thinking and our entire industry is suffering from short term thinking. And I'm, yeah, you know, I'll be candid. I'm actually pretty damn angry about it because there's enough designer wear and shoe Rolex flash and watches Lambo driving money. And it has really totally, you can bleak this Caleb, but it's up mm-hmm. the way contractors are thinking about their business and treating their business. The good side of it is they're making money like they never had before. The bad side of it is they're getting really close to destroying this trade from a different angle. It used to be we were all chucks in the trucks and not charging enough. And now it's almost like, or has it flipped over to the other side of the scale and everybody's ripping everybody off and they're just grabbing dollars and it's great. It's the, it's the De Beers of handiwork. It's gross. In, in, yeah, you absolutely. Know, but I, I think there's an opportunity here though with within every challenge there is an opportunity to stand 600 feet above your competition by doing things differently when this company decided to do a club membership they charged appropriately for the garage door replacement to make the math work when you only look at a profit and loss statement for the month or the year and you fail to put 10 of those things together assuming that 10 years is your your buy cycle for your big ticket item, you lose sight of the opportunity that you're giving up by treating your customers as a number transaction. That relational play makes this company significantly more money and more valuable and way more valuable. This is a company who's for 38 years, never exceeded four and a half million dollars in revenue in less than two years is going to exceed 16 million in revenue. And it's not because they're getting money hungry. It's because they're treating people right and getting referred left, right, and center because they're treating people right. Mm -hmm. This has disproportionate payoffs that go right to the net EBITDA because now you're not spending as much to get a garage door lead and chase the today customer and then try to make that today customer pay off today uh in in the PL. and this is a lost art uh yeah. that's, that's and this was the basis game. of my last article in, in the wizard of ads blog where uh, I, I quoted this that from the service titan residential contract report that 71 percent of the business last year came from word of mouth and it was easy when there was a lot of great deals and the economy was boosting and there was cash and people were home and Todd, as Ken Goodrich said yesterday, right? We, 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 were, we were having this conversation in, in, on Facebook. Uh, people can't continue to be sloppy. 2024 is going to be a revelation for a lot of companies that have not been doing the basics, not been blocking, tackling, and nurturing these relationships. Because ultimately, I think that's what I'm hearing from both of you saying, yeah, the guy was okay, but he could have done more to nurture me as a relationship. So it's this yeah. is the one I'm neutral on. I could go, I could not go. I think with that guy, first of all, I don't know why those bolts are coming loose, but I, I gave an estimation as to what I thought it was. And I, I suspect it's either that there's vibration in the system or those holes are, are worn out, right? It's, holes it's are one worn of out. two things. Yeah. 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 There, there's something going on there. He he could have known that when he left. He might have known, oh, these aren't really catching like they should have. Who fundamentally knows? I can't get into that guy's head. So for him, what I would say is I might give him one other chance and watch very skeptically and very closely to see his responses. But you already described him as you can't even remember who he is, so I might not. I, I think you could be okay either way. The reality is, is that I think you're all right if you make a call, but I, I wouldn't get burned three times, but it's unclear yeah. to me if he actually burned you. It seems. Like- no, he didn't burn me. I felt yeah. fine. He did the repair. He got my garage door open. You know, it lasted a little over here. I'm fine. I'll, I'll probably move over to, uh, you know, a company near me that has 
between his two locations, over 2,000 five-star reviews. Let, one question. Just one uh, question. Let me just ask you one question. Sure. Is there any chance whatsoever, 18 months ago, he gave you warning of other items, but you just don't remember? No, I, I'm pretty good at remembering remember. that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, the, you're smarter the, than the average bear. Yeah, yeah. The 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 garage door opener is relatively new. I put that in, not the previous owner. The door is older, but the door looks in great shape. Yeah. The rails are a little beat up. There's no question about that. Gotcha. All right. And, and I'm only asking, because having been in the shoes of a contractor, having been in the shoes, I spoke from experience. I know there were times when I was a technician that I made recommendations, even put them in writing, but I didn't say it the right way because I wasn't heard. Yeah. But you're smarter than average bear. So we're going to give you a pass and say it was all him. <laughs> okay. So now let's go to the last one. And the last one's a little bit more interesting because it is the big ticket. Okay. It's a full roof replacement. September 24th, I'm hearing all of a sudden the knocks on the windows. We have baseball size hail coming down in, in my part of, of Austin. It was pretty bad. My car is in the shop right now trying to get rid of, take care of all the hail damage finally. And the roof, I was waiting to get the car taken care of and my daughter's car taken care of so I can manage the roof because we also launched a new business. You, you guys know it's been a little bit of a busy time here. Had the, the roof come, the, the, the roofer come out. I had four or five different companies come out the previous year to take a look because everybody's getting their roof replaced as well because there was a smaller storm. And when my insurance adjuster came out, they said, nah, don't, they don't really see that. There's damage, like on the soft metals and on the gutters and stuff, but and the lights that were broken, but I can't really give you for the roof. This year they came out, adjuster came out, lots of roof damage, no question, we're going to replace the roof. Mm-hmm. I already, they already sent, cut me the check. I have the money sitting in my account. I send over the estimate to the final roofer that I waited for the last time. Again, it's a known entity, friends of friends. Yeah, the owner, I don't want to bring up names, but it's like friend of friend. And so I send him the estimate. He had come out here for the first inspection of the roof and told him where we're at. And he comes back, one, with a price that's slightly above what the insurance covered, which, mm -hmm. okay, it's a little above, but without a real clear breakdown about why, just here's the number, and it's like $1,200, $1,300 above what the insurance quoted me, so it was more money out of my pocket. And in the meantime, I also have solar, and I've got to take care of that mostly out of my pocket as well. So I've got to take down, put it on, and we all know the solar guy. Corinne's son, great young man, and he's taking care of it. And he, he's one of the best contractors I have. Yeah. He always he's, takes care of everything. He's amazing. I'm not surprised, right? Great guy. And in this in the email that I sent back to the person at this company that was taking care of me, I said, look, I'm ready to move forward, but I have a couple of questions. I said, one, what if I want to change the color of the shingles? Mm -hmm. Right. Because I I want to match more of what the interior of the house is. I see a lot of the houses here changing to black shingles. I'm figuring I might want to go that route. And he's like, well, I don't know anything about that, blah, blah, blah. And I'm essentially been waiting three weeks since I said I'm ready to move on to get myself on the schedule. Because I know that getting on these schedules are three weeks to a month out. Okay. And I already said to him, just I just don't know what's going to be with the HOA, but I want, but I'm ready to move forward. I don't have a contract. I don't have a date. I don't have anything. Meanwhile, I'm walking around the corner. One of my neighbors tells me, oh yeah, you should call these guys. They're that guy's nephew, another one of our neighbors. They grew up around here, does great work. You should talk to them. What would you do? Okay. I got a question or two just to get clarity. Okay. On the HO th a thing, I want to make sure I understand. You want to change your color. Did did that – because I feel like in the email that you sent, I, I might have read something, maybe I'm implying something, where he was saying check with your HOA. Yeah, they, they don't know anything about it. 
and, yeah. and look, and here's the crazy thing. I know solar is a little different than everything else, but I know when I did solar, the, the, my solar guy, the solar guys, actually took care of the HOA paperwork for me. Okay. Gotcha. And I know it's a little bit different with solar than roofing. But here's the thing for me as a customer, and again, I, I may be outrageous, but if you're local, truly local, I could walk to their offices. Okay. It's a walk, but it's not, but it's walkable. Okay. They do plenty of business in our neighborhood. They've been here plenty of years. I don't need you to know every HOA off the top of your head, but there's no reason why you shouldn't know, hey, yeah, they have this one form. You fill it out basically overnight and they're going to they're gonna approve it because it's exactly. not a big deal. And he just left me with, I don't know, and I didn't hear back. Okay. Yeah, so and it literally was, by the way, fill out the one form and it got approved overnight. Yeah, it's easy. It's easy. It. it this just sounds just like, like a pure example of, of a salesperson not being reliable. I don't think it goes beyond that. I think you got a salesperson that isn't being reliable. And I want to take the company out of the equation. I'm just going to purely get into your shoes for a moment and say any actions that you take after this point, totally justifiable. If you just want to call another roofing company, totally justifiable. They, they've let you down. If you want to, pick up the phone and call the roofing company and say, I want to use you, but I've been waiting for three weeks. I've heard nothing. Why are you letting me down? Totally justifiable. You're not in the wrong at this mm -hmm. point. Nowhere is Brian in the wrong in this scenario. Not one little bit. I got nothing else to say about it. The company's letting you down. Yeah. Or, or he, did, or as a salesperson, he didn't pick up my urgency as well, which is I have my son coming into town. I want to get it done before. It's a I'm sale. Still waiting. It's a sale. You, he's going three weeks without hearing from you. No, he is. I probably know the guy. I bet uh, I might. Uh, we, I we, 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 we could talk offline about that one. Yeah, that's what's breaking in my heart is like, uh, is, uh, geez, that's a failure. That, that's actually a failure on a couple of components. That's a failure on the salesman. That's also a failure on the sales manager. It, it really, truly is. Sales management should be digging into questions and sniffing out opportunities. And Elmore and I always have this conversation. I say, Elmore, there's a difference between training and management, and we need to do both. Training is when you're sharpening the saw of somebody and you're focusing on skill sets. You may be taking instances from the field to do that. Management is let's take a look at your funnel. Let's take a look at what's in the pipeline. What's the process? Where are we communicating? What's the probability of closing? So th this is a failure, not just on an individual. It's a failure on the manager as well. This manager should be aware of this and should have taken care of it already. I'll argue that it goes one step further, Please guys. Do. And the, the, the one step further. Culture. It, culture. It is, well, culture, cul it is ultimately always going to be reflective of culture because culture is reflective of leadership. And where this falls between the cracks is the crack between marketing and sales. Marketing says, I'll get you the lead. You go and sell it. And sales yeah. goes, I went out to the lead and they didn't buy today. And then it goes into the ether. Yeah. Right. We're now somewhere in, in some sort of white space between two dimensions. And this customer waits for the rest of their life until they take it upon themselves to get sold by the same company or just somebody else. And really what we're talking about here is this gray area of prospecting and follow-up. And ultimately what we're dealing with here is what can we do to one, check on what we expect, right? Inspect what we expect. And for me, I have an ongoing list. I know every single person that we've been out to, if they are not closed, they are still on my list. There's only two ways out to buy something or a body bag. <laughs> <laughs> and when we have one of those two things, then we have I wonder an he action. Up hidden in the forest, deep in, in the Canadian right. wilderness. Now we know where all we the bodies are buried. We don't need to speak about any of those things. Yes, there's nothing happening here. <laughs> but what we need to pay attention to that and we allow it to happen 
because there may not be a sales manager. The general manager, the owner is the sales manager, and they've got so many fires that they're putting out that they don't have time for the truly important. They're too busy focusing on the merely urgent. And that's a big deal. That's now, the second story. part of it is, what can we automate? Now, one of my brilliant clients, just a smart whippersnapper, this fellow goes, I'm going to use automations to my advantage. And he's picked up uh, Hatch and Chirp are, are really cool text messaging things. And when it gets back into the hopper, if it is an unsold lead, it is going into an incessant sales cycle. Now, not salesy cycle. A sales cycle where it's reaching out to client, reaching out to client, reaching out to client nonstop to make sure that this client doesn't fall off the radar if there's opportunity left. Now, it's smart automa automation. So if they respond in a certain way, something stops, something else starts, something stops, it stops altogether, it goes into a nurture campaign. Automations today are designed to take the expectation off of the shoulders of the salesperson whose job is to point in one direction, sell, not to look back and go, what did I already pass and speak to and deal with that could have been sold, that is low-hanging fruit, that is an opportunity, and, and th this comes down to the responsibility of the owner first Let's yeah, not yeah. pick on the salesperson because the salesperson might be being booked to five or six or seven calls a day when they should be being booked to three or four max and forgetting about the stuff behind you because there's only one direction that he's being pointed or she. I got one yeah but to that. Yes, I agree with everything you said. But some automation systems... Uh, require a trigger that takes place from the salesperson. And if it doesn't get that trigger from the salesperson, some you can time to happen with automatic approach, but yes. usually there has to be some level of status update. The other with thing that you can trigger is an automation to the salesperson. Yeah, this is my yeah, but I'm agreeing with all those things. You and I have been in multiple workflows. We use a really sophisticated workflow ourselves. My, my only yeah, but to this is if that salesperson is just not even doing the basic things that they're supposed to do, you can even trigger the automation to the sales manager to say, Hey, this person isn't moving it into the proper lead status. I agree with you hundred percent. Everyone is overworked, overloaded. You're very empathetic. That's very kind. Roy thinks I'm this super nice guy. As, as I've been telling Dave, I'm not as nice as he thinks. <laughs> I'm going to, I need to be nicer. This, this is an area to where, this is where the area where my bulldog nature would take over and go, let's drill this down. Cause you're totally right, Ryan. But I'm just thinking about the things that I have seen. And at some point, even with automation, there's always a moment of human interaction. Now it's getting smarter and smarter. AI will change the game on this and not too short of a distant future to where it can start doing some of this management for us and start making these triggers happen automatically. But at some point in time, you can go, the guy didn't even tell us the status. I don't disagree. System. I think oh, that yeah. he, go he, ahead. Had told, he had told me uh, when I had written, let's move forward. I said, I don't we'll wait, but we have to wait to hear from the HOA. He should have done what one of the other roofers basically said is, look, let me get you on the books. We'll schedule it out three weeks from now. Yes. And I'll put the color to be determined. But I need to know by the end of the week or so, so that I can put the material order in. Right. Yeah, he knew his assignment. Big yeah. difference. And you know what? One satisfied me. One left me hanging. Yeah. All of these situations come down to something that, that Roy and I have recently been spending an, an incredible amount of, of time on, and that's the, the friction in the flywheel caused by communication or the lack thereof. True. And if we can really just step into finding those spots where friction has been created with the customer, with the salesperson, with the process, with the whatever, 
and find ways to solve the problem through an automation, a process, a, a removal of a process, and frankly, a checkpoint with relevant things, we would see that this job doesn't need to be as complicated as it is and really start to lean in on the truly important and start eliminating or reducing the amount of merely urgent fires that come up every day. I love it. Now, it it kind of triggers something in me, which is the fact that over half of all marriages end up in divorce and most of those because of communication issues. It, It would almost sound to me what I'm hearing from both of you is maybe some of these companies would benefit from having professional communicators to help them along. Well, we do appreciate those fellas. Todd, where could we find some of those good fine th- th- funds? I think between you and I, we could take care of them. We could probably figure that stuff out. Yeah. And and you look, that that's really what it comes down to now. We're not counselors, but we do study the human condition, both biologically and, and psychologically. What it really does come down to is recognizing that, yeah, there is a way to solve this problem. It's always going to be communication, mm-hmm. even when it's hard. Yeah. So we have an acronym for people that have uh, ADD and, and lots of business owners, salespeople, they have ADD, right? Attention deficit disorder. So they, ADD is good. They just have the wrong type. They need to automate, delegate, and delete. When they get that ADD, their life gets better. So again, they need to automate, delegate, and delete. And that's what you said. What are some things that they're doing that they shouldn't be doing? It's one of the first exercises we take management through. What are the things that we can automate? Let's get these things completely off the plate. What are the things that you can delegate off of you? And what are the things that you or no one should be doing that we're wasting time and energy with? We're just going to delete those things. ADD is good. It's just the wrong ADD. We need to automate, delegate, delete. Gentlemen, this has been fabulous. I'm hoping all the business owners who take the time to listen to this got a lot of the nuggets that were in here. We're going to have to do this again because I've got I've got some other fun stories that uh, <laughs> that we can analyze and break down everything from uh, man pest control companies like yeah we'll we'll have to go into some of these because I think there's there's lots of lessons to be learned in the real world this way. We're not getting that that pre or post mortem. Also, what you were talking about, Todd, with looking at what's happening with all the sales leads, we're not taking the time as business owners to get involved in that. And we need to, because if we want to be successful in 2024 and beyond, we better get good at taking care of our customers. So true, 100%. Absolutely.